Judge Kavanaugh, um, I want to get back to a couple of questions that my colleague, Senator Whitehouse, was asking you a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, did anyone from the Federalist Society contact you uh, about the vacancy after Justice Kennedy made his announcement that he would be stepping down from the court? No. Um, and uh, during the campaign of President Trump, as I recall, he came out with two different lists, two different lists of possible Supreme Court nominees. The first list had 11 names uh, on it. The second list, if I'm not mistaken, had 21 names on it, which included the previous 11. Uh, there were reports at the time that uh, some outside groups had had some involvement in that. Were you involved in, in the first list? Were you included in the first list? I was not. Were you included in the second list? I was not. Okay, so, so you were... Um, you became under consideration only after President Trump took office, correct? That's my understanding. That's when I became identified. And after he it. was staffed up, uh, after he had his own staff, his own staff within the White House. Um, within the Supreme Court, is it the case that there is an aisle, much as there is in the United States Senate or the United States House of Representatives? There's no aisle or separate caucus rooms in the Supreme Court, uh, either literally or figuratively, in my view. Uh. And uh, under most circumstances, in most years, in recent, in the past decade or so, um, the number of cases that are decided on a five to four margin have been very low, less than 20% as far as I can count. Is that roughly consistent with your understanding? That is. Uh, meaning that the configuration of five to four is much less common than basically all of the, all of the others. It is uh, dwarfed in comparison to those cases that are decided either nine to zero, which is often the biggest contingent, or eight to one, mm -hmm. or seven to two, or six to three. Now, even in those cases that are decided five to four, does the fact that it was decided five to four make it any less of a legitimate decision? Does it make the judgment any less binding on the parties in that case? No, it is still a decision of the court, uh, no matter what the, what the uh, ultimate majority opinion is uh, composed of. And it would, be, would it behoove uh, a, a lawyer uh, uh, who was an officer of the court to call into question the subjective motivations of a court simply because of the fact that the court decided a case on a five to four basis? Well, I, I, if I were a lawyer arguing before the Supreme Court, I probably would uh, refrain from questioning <laughs> the uh, motivations of the justices. I think each of the justices, uh, I know them, uh, they are uh, all committed to the Constitution uh, of the United States and impartially discharging their duties, of course, have different perspectives on certain issues, and, uh, but they're all, I think we're fortunate to have eight, eight hardworking uh, justices who have outstanding records and are committed to the Constitution and committed to the independence of the judiciary. What about in the, dis in the, uh, in the circuit court, in the D.C. circuit where you have served? Yeah. Would it be fair to suggest that a case is somehow less legitimately decided if that case were decided along um, the lines of the which president appointed which member of the D.C. Circuit? The precedent stands uh, either, uh, either way. Thank you. Um, I want to get back to a separation of powers point that has come up along uh, uh, various lines of questions asked by my colleagues today. Is the Constitution relegated to the judicial branch? Is it something that is to be upheld and interpreted only by those who wear black robes? Uh, no, Senator. You did, let me take you through the process, I think. So Congress, of course, passes laws, and in considering laws, Congress will also uh, often assess the possible constitutionality of the laws passed. So in the first instance, when you're considering uh, the passage of a law, you might assess the First Amendment implications, or if it's a uh, national security, the Fourth Amendment implications. 
and uh, what are the due process, Fifth Amendment implications? And, and we've all taken our own oath to uphold the Constitution. Right. So you do your best, and then the executive branch as well, their constitutional, whether to sign the bill, for example, for the president, if the president has a constitutional concern or, or a policy concern, but the president could veto the bill for that reason. That has certainly happened historically. Uh, and then when it comes to the court, uh, of course, we are... Uh, we assess in cases or controversies the constitutionality of a law that is challenged there in the context of a specific case or controversy. We don't, you know, President Washington, George Washington, asked the Supreme Court for an advisory opinion in his first term uh, on a disputed uh, legal issue. Uh, actually, might have been his second term, uh, but he, President George Washington asked for an opinion. The Supreme Court respectfully wrote back and said, we don't uh, provide advisory opinions on, we only decide cases or controversies, thereby, I think, underscoring the point you're making with your question, which is constitutionality of, of laws is assessed, in the, is assessed in the first instance by Congress and the executive. Yep. So it would, be not, it would not be inappropriate for us as members of the legislative branch to decide uh, to protect something that we believe is constitutionally protected, regardless of where we might place our bets on what the courts would do with it. If, if we see a particular right that might be jeopardized by an act of Congress we are considering, wouldn't be inappropriate for us to say, look, we, we're not sure exactly how far the Supreme Court will go here. Out of an abundance of caution, out of respect for the Constitution, we're going to draw the line more carefully so that we make sure that we don't step into unconstitutional territory. That has happened historically and I think happens today. And the, that, that underscores how the Constitution tilts toward liberty in so many different ways. It tilts toward uh, liberty because it, it's hard to pass a law, as you know, with both houses and the president. And then not only might there be policy objections, but members of, of Congress might say, well, even if the Supreme Court would uphold this law based on my assessment of the Supreme Court, I have a First Amendment objection, Fourth Amendment objection, uh, Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishments clause objection, equal protection objection, and based on my view of the Constitution, I'm going to vote no on this law. That's a, another way in which the constitutional structure all fits together and tilts toward liberty. For that very reason, it would probably lead to some bad results if we were to not do that. In other words, if we were always inclined to say, let's just pass this, if it's unconstitutional, the court will do something about it. Can you well, foresee uh, instances in which that could create problems? Yes, Senator. I think Justice Kennedy has written eloquently about this. Each, each official, each officer in Congress, each member of Congress, each senator, the president takes an oath, of course, a constitutional oath, to um, abide by the Constitution. And that's very important for each member to understand and underscore, as I know all of you do, and that is, an, that is an important part of the separation of powers process. I don't think uh, that the framers thought, well, let's pass something even though we ourselves, uh, meaning the members of Congress, think there's a constitutional problem here. And that, that's not how it has worked historically, nor do I think that's how the framers necessarily intended for Congress to work. And there are myriad instances, moreover, in which uh, we might enact something that, for one reason or another, might not be challenged for a long time, or might be difficult to challenge uh, due to justiciability issues, somebody lacking standing, uh, absence of a ripe controversy, and so forth. That, that particularly happens in the national security context, I think, uh, Senator, because there's often not someone with standing, especially if it's something being done in a foreign country against, uh, against foreign citizens that... Uh, might be difficult to get into court in some way or another. One of the reasons I focus on this today is that there was a, uh, an exchange you had with one of my colleagues earlier today about uh, the indefinite detention of American citizens uh, apprehended on U.S. soil. Mm -hmm. There was some discussion surrounding this suggesting that ex parte Curran might somehow justify this. Uh, you don't need to respond to this, but I think uh, it's, it's a point that needs to be mentioned Justice Scalia mentioned in his dissent in Hamdi that uh, ex parte Curran was uh, not this court's finest hour. Uh, and in fact, what happened was the case was argued, um, it was decided the next day, uh, 
uh, the saboteurs were taken out and executed the next week, then the opinion itself was issued many months later. So again, I'm not asking you to opine on the ongoing validity of ex parte current, uh, but the point is um, uh, you seem to agree that Congress certainly has the authority to protect liberty, notwithstanding the possibility that the Supreme Court might not step in in a particular case. Absolutely. A couple of points in response to that, Senator, if I might. Uh, Justice Scalia, of course, dissented in that case, joined by Justice Stevens. One of his uh, more powerful dissents uh, on individual liberty. Uh, one of his more powerful dissents, protecting individual liberty, there ruling uh, Justice Scalia with Justice Stevens that it was impermissible to hold an American citizen in long-term military detention. And I thought that was an important opinion of his. When I gave a talk once about Justice Scalia, I identified that as one of his most important opinions and a very powerful opinion. On the Kieran opinion itself, it also dealt with some uh, many who were not uh, American citizens, but you're right, there was an American, there's American citizen involved. Uh, the court, you're right also, of course, uh, you, you've studied this as much as anyone, but the court did resolve the case very quickly. In the opinion, I've spent many an hour trying to decipher certain paragraphs of that opinion uh, for cases I've had. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. I will, I will say the court, to its credit, give a little credit, did have an eight hour or something oral argument. The Attorney General of the United States argued Kieran personally, and I read the transcript of that to try to figure out what was going on in the opinion uh, that did not unlock the box completely for me on what was going on in the Kieran opinion. But your point, Justice Scalia did say it's not was not the court's finest hour. It was a rush, uh, it was a rush. Uh, and rushes, sometimes the court has to rush, uh, but rush decisions uh, in, in a judicial context uh, sometimes aren't, aren't always the, the best. On that point, would you be open to the idea of bringing back the era of the eight-hour oral argument? I mean, yeah. Be fun. <laughs> yeah, the, I don't, uh, the eight-hour oral, oral argument. We did have one in, a, uh, in an in-bank case uh, maybe two years ago that went, went all afternoon. I don't, that I don't like after we got back to the conference room, I don't think anyone was uh, saying we should do that in every case. Understood, <laughs> understood. Uh, let's talk about um, judicial philosophy for a minute. I'd like to discuss Federalist 78. Mm -hmm. um, in Federalist 78, Hamilton discusses the dichotomy between will on the one hand and judgment on the other. Uh, will being something that is exercised by the political branches, primarily by the Congress, by the legislative branch, and judgment being something exercised by the judicial branch. What's the difference between those two? <clears throat> The uh, judicial branch is deciding cases or controversies according to law. The uh, legislative branch is making the policy, exercising the will. Uh, the judicial branch can never uh, exercise the policy-making role that is reserved to the Congress. Now, admittedly, that's speaking at a level of generality, and there are tough cases at the margins always I'm trying to figure out what the line is here. But as a general proposition, it's important for every judge to go in with the mindset of, uh, I'm not the policymaker. I'm the law interpreter, the law applier in a particular case. And I think that's a very important part of the Federalist Papers that's woven into the constitutional structure, into Article Three, and that uh, judges, I certainly have tried for 12 years as a judge on the DC Circuit to incorporate that basic foundational principle into how I approach each case. And uh, it, it is a very critical bedrock principle of what judges do in our constitutional system. Now, within that framework, when we enact a law, uh, what determines what it is that you have to interpret it, or that you have to interpret? Is it, is it what we say, or is it what we subjectively intended? It is what is written in the text of the statute. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, Justice Kagan said it well at a talk uh, two years ago, maybe three, at, at Harvard Law School. I was present in the audience. She said, we're all textualists now. She was talking about Justice Scalia, who, of course, uh, brought about 
significant change in the focus of all federal judges. I've seen it across the supposed philosophical spectrum. All federal judges pay very close attention to the text of the statute. And that's why I think Justice Kagan said we're all textualists now because she explained uh, that every judge really cares about the words that are passed by Congress. Now, why, why is that? I think about it both from a formal and a functionalist perspective. As a formal matter, the law passed uh, by Congress is the binding law. As a, as a, it is the what is signed by the President. It's what's gone through the Senate and the House, and that is the law. But also as a practical or functional matter, uh, I think the, having seen the legislative process, I know how compromises come together in the House and the Senate, within the Senate, within the House. There's negotiations late at night over precise words and compromises inevitably. Legislation is compromised. The Constitution was a compromise. Legislation is a compromise. And when we depart from the words that are specified in the text of the statute, we're potentially upsetting the compromise that you all carefully negotiated in the legislative negotiations that you might have had with each other. And so that's a danger that I try to point out when we're having oral argument in a case or we're deciding cases that if we deviate from what Congress wrote, we're potentially upsetting this careful compromise, even if we think we would have struck the compromise in a different place as judges, that's not really our role. So I think both as a formal and functional matter, it's important to stick to the text. There are canons of interpretation, which occasionally uh, cause you a presumption of mens rea, presumption against extraterritoriality and the like, that cause you to superimpose a presumption on the text. But otherwise, sticking to what you passed is very important. But you certainly consider yourself a textualist, and if you follow Justice Kagan's statement, we're all textualists now. We're, Meaning, we're, that's what judging is. Judging, ju is. Ju judging is paying attention to the text, in statutory cases, paying attention attention to the text of the statute, uh, informed by those canons of construction such as presumption against extraterritoriality, presumption of mens rea, presumption against implied repeals, uh, things like that that are settled canons, although some of the canons are not so settled, which is a whole separate half hour of discussions. How does textualism relate to or differ from originalism? So uh, originalism, as I see it, uh, has, uh, to my mind, means, in essence, constitutional textualism, meaning the original public meaning of the constitutional text. Now, the originalism, it's very careful when you talk about originalism to understand that people are hearing different things sometimes. So uh, Justice Kagan, again, at her, con at her confirmation hearing, said we're all originalists now, uh, which was her comment. By that, she meant the, the precise text of the Constitution matters. And by that, the original public meaning, of course, informed by history and tradition and precedent, those, those matter as well. There's a different conception that some people used to have of originalism, which was his original intent. In other words, what did the people, some people subjectively think, intend. subjectively intend the text to mean? And that uh, has fallen out of the analysis because... For example, let's just take the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Well, it says right in the text, equal protection. Equal means equal. As the Supreme Court said in Strouder, what is that but the law shall be the same for the black and the white. That's Brown v. Board, focuses on the text. But there were some uh, racist members of uh, Congress involved in the red who didn't think it should apply in, in that way to certain, uh, certain least aspects of public life. But we don't, if you're doing, paying attention to the text, you don't take account of those subjective intentions, and nor is it proper as a general proposition uh, to take account of the subjective intentions. They can be evidence in certain cases, the First Amendment, for example, of the meaning of the words. Of the original public meaning. They can be of the original public meaning. They can be evidence of that, but you're not, you don't follow the subjective intention. So the original public meaning originalism, uh, what I've referred to as constitutional textualism, what Senator Cruz yesterday, I think, referred to as constitutionalism or constitutionalist. I think those are all referring to the same things, which is the words of the Constitution matter. Of course, as I've said repeatedly, you also look at historical, uh, the history, you look at the tradition, Federalist uh, uh, 37, 39 to, uh, 37 tells us to look at the liquidation of the meeting by historical practice over time. And then you look at precedent, which is woven into Article 3, uh, as I said, in Federalist 78. But the 
you, you know, start with the words, as Justice Kagan said, we're all originalists now in that respect of paying at least some attention to, or more than some, paying attention to the words of the Constitution. So if we stipulate for our purposes today, as we're having this conversation, that originalism uh, refers to basically textualism applied in the constitutional sphere with an eye toward identifying the original public meaning of the constitutional text at issue, you're an originalist. That, that's, that's correct, and Justice Kagan, as Justice Kagan said, I think that's what she meant, we're all originalists now, and I, don't, I, I think she said what she meant and meant what she said when sure. she said that. Uh, what, by the way, would be the argument against that? Uh, to me, that sounds like judging. What, what would one argue uh, against being that type of judge, against being a textualist originalist? Well, there are different philosophies of, of what a judge does, but I think the judges, uh, you know, what the role of a judge is. But I think the law, the Article 6 of the Constitution says, uh, this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. And the word law is very important there. It's not a set of aspirational principles. It's, a, it's law that can be applied in court and what is the law? The law are the words that were ratified by the people and therefore can be applied in the, um, in the courts uh, of the United States. And it says the supreme law, what does it mean by that? It means when you pass a statute that is inconsistent with the, the Constitution, the supreme law controls, namely the uh, Constitution controls over a contrary statute. And that's, of course, also discussed uh, in Federalist 78 as well of what's the supreme law of the land, and the Constitution's the supreme law. Again, precedent, history, uh, historical practice subsequent to the passing of the text. We see that, for example, in Establishment Clause cases. The court will often look at the text, what's the historical practice, and precedent, which I've said is rooted in Article Three. Those things all go into it, but the words, the original public meaning, are, are uh, an important part of constitutional interpretation. It has been, I think, throughout. Let's suppose Congress, in its infinite wisdom, um, with its approval rating that ranges between 9 and 11 percent, making us slightly less popular than Raul Castro in America and slightly more popular than the, in the influenza virus, which is rapidly gaining on us. Uh, what if we decided that, you know, we're all busy, there are parades to attend, there are uh, political rallies to organize, uh, that we, we, we get tired of, of the busy, uh, drudgerous work of actually making laws, and we also don't want to make ourselves accountable for the laws we pass. It's much easier to just pass a broader statement. So we say, we hereby pass a law that says, we in the United States of America shall have good law, and we hereby delegate to the herewith created United States Commission on the Creation of Good Laws the power to promulgate and interpret and enforce good laws in the United States. What constitutional issues do you see there? <clears throat> Senator, the Congress is, of course, uh, assigned the legislative power in Article I of the Constitution. So if it uh, delegates wholesale the constitutional power to uh, another body, then that naturally poses a question of whether the body exercising that power ultimately has uh, improperly exercise the legislative power and whether that rule or what have you that is enacted by that body is lawful because it was not enacted by Congress. So uh, the, the, the framers intended that Congress would enact the laws and that the executive would enforce the laws and that the judiciary would of course, resolve cases and controversies arising under those laws. And yet, in some respects, it's not that far removed from some of what we do today. We may not pass something as extreme as what I've described in my hypothetical, but in some cases, we will essentially say we shall have good law in Area X, and we hereby give Commission Y the power to make and enforce good laws uh, in that area. Um, so is there po some point at which we, we cross a threshold of unconstitutional delegation? Well, the Supreme Court, as you know, Senator, has a non-delegation principle. And it, it, at least under current precedent, it has allowed the uh, delegation, uh, and I don't want to get too specific here, but it has allowed some delegation. Now, some justices or judges would say, actually, when the executive 
enacts rules pursuant to those delegations, that's the exercise of executive power, but I think there's been some pushback on that, and in any event, the Supreme Court has a doctrine on the non-delegation principle, and the line is uh, debated on where that should be drawn, but there is precedent that uh, does suggest that at some point, Congress can go too far in how much power it delegates to an executive or independent agency. And when we do that, at some point, uh, we're shirking our own responsibility because we're making lawmakers rather than laws. And we're also consolidating into one body the power to make and enforce laws, which is not uh, only something that can lead to tyranny. It's the very definition of tyranny itself. I want to get to the campaign finance discussion that you were having a few minutes ago with Senator Whitehouse. Um, with regard to Citizens United, didn't the Supreme Court uphold the disclosure requirements at issue in Citizens United? Uh, it did. I, I believe that was an eight to one margin. And, and in fact, you've, you've written on this, that there is a distinction for First Amendment purposes, for constitutional purposes, uh, between laws mandating disclosure and laws uh, banning the doing or the saying of something. Isn't that right? That, that is what the Supreme Court has said in certain contexts, and, and that is the law as set forth by the Supreme Court. The, <clears throat> they, Citizens United is a good example of that, Senator. And, and in a case called Emily's List versus FEC, you wrote that disclosure requirements um, uh, trigger a rights that, uh, that receive, quote, less First Amendment protection close quote, uh, then speech prohibitions, other types of speech prohibitions. And I, and I think that uh, followed from and is, uh, Supreme Court law and is consistent, I believe, with subsequent Supreme Court law. Of course, the subsequent Supreme Court law controls. Okay. Do you have a favorite among the Federalist Papers? Um, <laughs> I have a, I'm, I'm not asking you to choose here between uh, uh, um, uh, between Eliza. Uh, and yeah, Martin. no, that's right. Yeah, um, uh, yes. Uh, so I, I like a lot of Federalist Papers. Uh, uh, Federalist 78, of course, the independent judiciary, the role of the judiciary. Federalist 69, which says uh, the presidency. Uh, is not a monarchy is very important when Hamilton explains all the ways in which the presidency is not a mar monarchy on our constitutional uh, system. I think that's very important. Federalist 10, which talks about factions in America and explains that having the separation of powers and the federalism system dividing power in so many different ways would help prevent a faction from gaining control of the entire all the power for the people of the United States, and that's, that makes it frustrating at times because it's hard to pass new legislation, but that also, that division of power helps protect individual liberty. I think that comes a bit from Federalist 10. Federalist 37 and 39 uh, talk about, on the one hand, uh, how we are just talking um, laws that are the Constitution over time can be the term liquidated by her historical practice. What does that mean? That means that as the branches uh, uh, fill out the meaning of the Constitution over time with practices, those can be relevant in how the court subsequently interprets certain provisions. We see that in Dames and Moore versus Regan, for example. We uh, talk also about the national and federal government. So the combination in, in 39, the combination uh, that we have this odd that's the genius, right, uh, of having a national government plus state governments, and then within the national government, the House rep is proportional representation, the Senate is state representation, that interesting compromise, which Madison, by the way, was opposed to, but that compromise at the convention. Federalist 47, which Senator Klobuchar mentioned yesterday, the accumulation of all power in, uh, in one body is the very definition of tyranny. I start my separation of powers class every year with that exact quote that you read yesterday, Senator Klobuchar, because that's very important. Um, 51, if men, if men were angels, we don't, we wouldn't need government. So I, I sorry, I've got like eight kids. Uh, it's uh, it's, no, it's, it's, it's yeah. br brilliant, and I, I think that's a great, um, greatest hits list. Um, if these were on Spotify, I'd say uh, you put together a <laughs> list of those. Uh, let's close in the, in the uh, 
uh, minute and a half I've got left. I gave myself an additional 30 seconds because of the two interruptions there. Um, tell me how you were informed by Federalist 51 and how that relates to your role as a jurist. Your role as a jurist now on the D.C. Circuit, the role that you would play if you were confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. This understanding that um, government is an exercise in understanding human nature. If we were angels, we wouldn't need government. And if we had access to angels to govern over, over us, we wouldn't need all these rules, mm -hmm. these cumbersome rules that make government so inefficient and so frustrating. Why is that important and how does that affect you as a judge when trying to interpret the Constitution and trying to interpret acts taken pursuant thereto? That's, a, that's an interesting question, Senator. I think we recognize that we're all imperfect. First of all, all of us as humans are imperfect and that uh, that includes judges, and that includes legislators, and includes all of us are imperfect. And so we uh, recognize uh, that uh, in uh, how we go about uh, setting up our government. Uh, if, if there were some perfect group of people, we'd put all the power in one, that one body. Uh, but because we're imperfect, putting all the power in that one body would be, as uh, Senator Klobuchar was saying, the definition of tyranny. So I think the way we deal with the imperfection while also having a government, because we're imperfect, is dividing the power, separating the power. And that, again, to my mind, that all reinforces why the framers, the genius, despite the flaws in the Constitution, and there were flaws, the genius of separating the legislative, executive, and judicial powers, tilting toward liberty in all those respects, and then having a federalism system where we still have state governments that can further protect liberty and be laboratories of democracy as well. I think all that is because we're imperfect and because we recognize uh, the imperfections. It's also why we have things like a jury system. Uh, and we, the, even within the judiciary, we didn't trust a judge to uh, do trials on uh, his or her own criminal trials We have a, or civil trials. We have a jury system to recognize, and we have usually 12. Uh, and, and that is designed to recognize that we're imperfect, and sometimes it, that's why we have group decision making. That's why we have 535 legislators. That's why we have nine justices. We don't usually have one person, and so two in jury. So I think that all maybe stems from the same uh, philosophical understanding that we're imperfect beings and that we divide power and that we make sure that. Um, no one person uh, in a jury situation or other situations where our liberty can be affected is exercising total control. Great. Thank you very much, Judge. My time has expired. I am not the chairman of this committee, even though I'm playing him on TV. <laughs> I understand that under the previous order entered before he left, we're supposed to take a 10-minute break. Uh, we will stand in recess for 10 minutes. <laughs>